The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Leora Fox. I'm the Manager of Research and Mission Programs at HDSA, and I'm here with our Director of Mission and Scientific Affairs, Dr. George Yorling. Hi, everyone. And uh, today we are very pleased to bring to you this month's HDSA research webinar, which will be presented by Wave Life Sciences. And Wave is a biotechnology company, and their, their goal is to bring meaningful therapies to patients with serious genetic diseases. And um, today, three representatives from WAVE are going to be talking about uh, their potential treatments to selectively lower mutant Huntington. So I'm just going to first uh, remind you how you can ask questions during the webinar and uh, mention a couple of upcoming webinars, and then I'll introduce our speakers and um, hand it over to them. Um, so to, answer, to ask a question during the webinar, you can actually enter a question at any time, and at the end of the presentation, um, we're, we'll um, uh, ask those questions and um, our WAVE representatives will answer them. Um, so at any time during the presentation, you can go to the control panel on the right of your screen, and there's a panel there for typing in a question, and after you type it in, you can just hit the send button. Um, so, to view this webinar again, um, or to, you know, share it with anybody who couldn't be here um, for the live presentation today, um, we're going to uh, have a link to this on our website, um, and to access it, you can go to hdsa.org slash research webinar, or you can go to HDSA's YouTube channel, and you'll be able to view this recording, as well as any past presentations. We will try to have it up within about a week. Um, and to mention just some upcoming webinars, we'll have one on uh, March 21st, that's uh, so a Wednesday from noon to 1, um, on how sheep can help us develop uh, Huntington lowering therapies by a researcher at uh, the University of Massachusetts, Dr. Edith Fister. And uh, in April, we'll have a webinar on neural stem cells as a therapeutic candidate for HD, which will be presented by Dr. Jack Reedling from UC Irvine. So look out for those upcoming webinars. Um, and now to introduce our speakers, we have three today. Uh, Dr. Serena Hung is a senior medical director at Wave Life Sciences and the clinical lead of the Huntington's program there. She's a neurologist by training with subspecialty training in movement disorders. She completed her fellowship training at the University of Toronto and prior to joining industry, she cared for movement disorder patients, including patients with Huntington's disease at her academic practice and was involved in clinical research at the Medical College of Wisconsin as an associate professor of neurology. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Brown is a principal scientist at Wave Life Sciences and he is the biology lead for the Huntington's program. He has a PhD in neuropharmacology from the University of Utah with a scientific background in uh, development of antisense oligonucleotides and RNA-based therapeutics for the treatment of neurodegenerative disorders. Wendy Erler leads uh, patient advocacy and market insights at Wave Life Sciences, and she is very passionate about working with the Huntington's disease community and meeting HD families. She's worked in patient advocacy across many rare disease communities, and she's responsible for bringing patient and caregiver insights back to Wave to help positively influence WAVE's clinical development and their commercialization planning. Um, Wendy earned her MBA from St. Joseph's University and her BA from Miami University. And uh, we welcome all of our speakers, and I will hand it over to them. Thank you, Leora, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. A big thanks to HDSA for giving us the opportunity to meet with all of you. We're excited for this, what we hope is the first of many webinars we get to um, bring to you the HD community. The purpose of today's webinar is to um, introduce you to Wave Life Sciences, our company, our approach, and our research aimed at treating the underlying cause of Huntington's disease. As you can see from the agenda, you'll get to hear from um, Dr. Jeff Brown as well as Dr. Serena Hung after I do a brief introduction. On this slide, you'll see our forward-looking statements. 
WAVE is a public company, and as such, we are obligated to make sure all of you are aware that much of what we may present will be forward-looking. In some cases, you can identify forward-looking statements by terms such as may, will, believe. So in essence, we all share the same hope. The forward-looking statements in this presentation are only predictions, and that's what this statement on this slide conveys. My name, as Leora said, is Wendy Erler, and I have the privilege of leading patient advocacy at WAVE. What this means is I work with HDSA and all of you to listen to your needs, your hopes, and to bring this insight into WAVE so we are working toward the same goals. We have a whole team of dedicated people focused specifically on Huntington's disease. Um, this is a little bit of an overview of WAVE as a company. We're a genetic medicines company developing targeted therapies for patients impacted by rare disease. What this means is that our goal is to really target the underlying cause of these diseases. Our special kind of secret sauce at WAVE is we have a unique technology and precise approach to developing therapies, which you'll hear more about in what we call stereo pure nucleic acid therapies. We can apply our technology to multiple modalities, including antisense, exon skipping, and RNA, RNAi. Our expertise and core focus is in neurological rare genetic diseases. And of note, early in our um, creation as a company, we made a significant commitment to not only focus on research and discovery and clinical development, but also to be able to manufacture future medicines that we hope to bring to the market. So we have a manufacturing facility that's up and running and a second wave location in Lexington, Massachusetts, in addition to our um, home office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On this slide, this infographic captures highlights of wave and gives you a look into the breadth and depth of our genetic medicines capabilities and focus. We initiated three clinical studies in 2017, two of which in the primary focus of today are in Huntington's disease. We have over 12 discovery programs that are active and ongoing, five unique therapeutic areas under development, and we um, have tested over 10,000 oligonucleotides created and analyzed to date. So we're very busy and we're excited for you to learn more about what we're doing. On this slide, you see our specific Huntington's disease pipeline. So we have two programs, one specifically called Mutant Huntington SNP1 and the other Mutant Huntington SNP2. These two clinical trial programs are called Precision HD, and you'll hear from Dr. Serena Brown what the significance is of, sorry, Dr. Serena Hung, what the significance is of SNP1 and SNP2. But first, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Jeff Brown. Thank you, Wendy. So what I'd like to do is just give you a very high-level genetics overview and try to explain to you some of the technologies that WAVE is using for the approach to treat Huntington's disease. So as we all know, our body is made up of cells, and those cells are composed of thousands of different types of proteins. And the information for how to make these proteins is stored in our DNA. Now, these instructions, um, now the DNA itself, although it codes for thousands of different proteins, is actually only made up of four different parts. And these parts are represented by letters usually as A, T, G, and C. And it's the different combinations of these letters that comprise what's known as the genetic code or the instructions for making these proteins. Now, when a protein needs to be made, these instructions or this code is sent out of the nucleus of the cell. And this, this photocopy, and this is done by, by sending a photocopied message of this DNA, and this photocopy is called RNA. This photocopy is then read by the cell, and this is how the cell actually makes the protein. Now, I want to introduce another term, and that term is mutation. And what a mutation represents is just a change in this code or a change in the instructions for making a protein. A mutation could be bad, it can be good, or it can actually have no effect on overall function of a cell. So on the next slide, so I want to talk now a little bit about Huntington's disease. And if you recall, I said that the DNA encodes instructions for making these different proteins. Now, actually, the DNA encodes two different copies of these instructions for making proteins. And how this relates to Huntington is that one copy of the instructions for making protein called Huntington is a normal or healthy um, 
make the normal or healthy protein. The other copy or instructions for making the Huntington protein actually has a mutation. And this mutation is an expansion or a repeat of the letter CAG that encodes the Huntington protein. And this is known as an expanded CAG repeat. <clears throat> so on the next slide, so all, all Huntington's patients have one copy of the normal Huntington protein and one copy of what's called the mutant Huntington protein. Now, although the, the exact function of the Huntington protein is not known, there are multiple indications that the normal or healthy Huntington protein plays an important role in neuronal brain function or brain function. And Wave's therapeutic approach is to specifically target or remove, or remove the mutant copy of the Huntington protein while leaving the normal copy relatively intact. And the way this is accomplished, it's accomplished by a drug known as an antisense oligonucleotide. Now, I just want to pause briefly and just give a little overview of what an antisense oligonucleotide is. So this is essentially a short piece of RNA or DNA that's made in a lab as a drug. Now, because we know all of the codes for making different proteins, we can make these oligonucleotides to match a specific code or instructions for making a protein then these oligonucleotides will stick to the RNA or this photocopy of the DNA and prevent the cell from reading instructions for making this protein. And then this oligonucleotide will essentially rip up this photocopy of the DNA and prevent the, the protein from being made. Now, I just want to pause for a brief second. So oligonucleotides go by many different names. Um, and you may hear the words antisense, antisense oligonucleotide, oligo, or aso but essentially all these words represent this mechanism of action for binding to the RNA and, and blocking the, the formation of protein. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the, the approach of the method that WAVE uses to target the mutant Huntington. And to do this, I wanna introduce another term, a SNP, or a single nucleotide polymorphism. So these SNPs are small changes in the DNA similar to mutation, but they actually don't have any negative or positive consequences usually. And in the example I'm showing you here, there's a single SNP, this is an A, and in the second copy or instructions for making a protein, this A is changed to a T. Now, SNPs are common and occur at a predictable frequency in our DNA. And as I said, most of these have actually very little impact on our overall health. Now, most people are familiar with SNPs. If you've heard of the, um, tools called Ancestry or 23andMe, what these actually do is use different SNP combinations to, to relate to our ancestry or where we're from. So, so this is probably where most people have heard the term SNP. So how does WAVE use SNPs to target the Huntington? So SNPs can act like a pin and direct you to a specific location on the DNA. <clears throat> and for the Huntington protein, it's a very large protein and there's many known SNPs. These don't necessarily contribute a cause to the disease, but they can give you specific location markers on the RNA or even the DNA for the Huntington protein. Now recall that I said each protein or instructions for making the protein has two copies. And patients with HD have one copy that has a mutant protein and one copy that has a normal or healthy Huntington protein. Well, these SNPs can associate with either the mutant or the wild type protein. So if you know the location of a specific SNP, you can actually identify or differentiate the mutant Huntington message from the wild type or normal Huntington message. So now I wanna bring all these concepts together. So I told you the DNA contains the instructions for making protein. These instructions are sent out of the nucleus in a molecule called RNA or a photocopy all of the nucleotides can stick to specific sequences within this photocopy or RNA and actually drive you to a specific type or mutant or, or wild type of the Huntington protein. Now, because there are SNPs that are associated with the mutant Huntington protein, we can actually target our antisense oligonucleotides to these SNPs to specifically degrade or knock down the mutant Huntington protein. And WAVE has a special um, stereopure oligonucleotide chemistry that allows us to bind to these specific SNPs and therefore target the mutant Huntington protein. 
So in conclusion, people with Huntington's disease have an error or a mutation in the Huntington gene, and this tells the body how to make the protein called Huntington. Everybody has two copies of the Huntington gene, and a genetic mutation in just one of these copies leads to the development of Huntington's disease. And a, the healthy Huntington protein is important for normal brain function, and the buildup of the mutant Huntington protein can cause progressive loss of brain cells. And Wade's novel therapeutic approach is to selectively target the mutant Huntington while leaving the normal or healthy Huntington relatively intact. So at this point, I'd like to tur turn it over to Dr. Sumiha to tell you a little bit about some of our clinical programs. Thank you. So uh, as Wendy and uh, Dr. Brown told you before, Wade is developing two investigational stereopure oligonucleotides to target uh, different SNPs in order to identify the um, in Huntington. So on this diagram, what we're showing you is that you know, one of the modules, WAVE 120101, targets what we call SNP1. And the long name of it, or the proper name of it, is actually RS362307. And WAVE 120102 is a second molecule, and it targets what we call SNP2, or the formal name RS362331. Um, so in Huntington's disease patients, about 50% of them may carry SNP1, and another 50% may carry SNP2. But some people actually carry both SNP1 and SNP2. So uh, because of this overlap, um, overall, um, we know that up to 70% of the total Huntington's patient population may carry SNP1, SNP2, or both. And as Dr. Brown um, mentioned to you before, the WAVE uh, approach is to selectively um, target the mutant Huntington. And I just wanted to show you some data uh, from some preclinical experiments using these two molecules uh, to show you what we mean by that. So on the uh, left-hand side, we're uh, looking at mRNA. Uh, and then on the right-hand uh, graph, we're looking at um, uh, Huntington protein. So I'm going to use the uh, right-hand graph um, to illustrate this concept. So um, just to walk you through this graph a little bit, uh, the purple shows you the wild type of healthy uh, Huntington protein, whereas the blue is showing you the mutant Huntington protein. We use uh, a control molecule and also use the wave molecule, wave 120101. Compared to the control molecule, the wave 120101 lowered um, the wild type of healthy protein by um, 22%. However, when you look at the blue, which is the mutant Huntington protein, you see that the wave 12101 molecule actually lower it by 70%, uh, quite a bit more. And that's what we meant by selective knockdown. Another question that we have when we're developing drugs is that, you know, does the drug actually get into the area that it needs to get to? So in order to um, illustrate this and, and understand this, we actually have done some experiments uh, in monkeys. And we gave the monkeys wave 120101 uh, through intrathecal bolus injection, which is the way that we're going to be uh, administering the drug in human. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more. But what we did was we gave monkeys uh, a dose of uh, the drug. And then we looked at whether the um, drug actually got into the brain. And sure enough, if you look at the red dot on the panel, um, this is actually showing you um, the molecule um, got into the brain in abundance. Uh, it actually got into some of the deeper um, areas in the brain, the deep gray matter structures. So this is, uh, you know, I showed you the data for wave 120101, which targets step one. Now this is the graph that shows you, um, you know, the data uh, using wave 120102, which targets step two. And I'm not going to go into any detail because it's a similar concept, looking at um, total Huntington protein versus mutant Huntington protein. And once again, uh, the wave molecule um, selectively lowered mutant Huntington uh, mRNA and protein. Once again, we did a similar experiment using wave 120102. And uh, once again, we actually saw that uh, the drug did get into the brain. And here we're showing you a slide of uh, the caudate nucleus, which is very important in, the Huntington's, uh, in Huntington's disease. 
So going into uh, just talking a little bit about the clinical trials that we're running. Uh, as Wendy mentioned before, we actually have two clinical trials. Um, they are both phase 1B, 2A um, clinical trial, and the main focus for this phase of the um, trial is to look at safety and tolerability of these uh, compounds. Um, we will be enrolling approximately 50 patients per trial, and the key inclusion criteria uh, will include you know, some of the following. Um, as we're using SIP1 or SIP2 as GPS pins, we have to make sure that the patients indeed do have SIP1 or SIP2. Um, the age range that we're going to be looking for is uh, between 25 to 65. And in this trial, we're uh, planning on enrolling people who already have symptoms of Huntington's disease, but they have to be um, in the early stages, so stage one or two. Patients will be um, given either active drug or placebo at random at a three to one ratio. And each patient will be receiving a total of four doses. Uh, the drug will be delivered by intrathecal injection. Um, we are uh, planning on having study sites in Europe and North America. And uh, we are planning to open uh, an open label extension study um, in these areas as well. So just a little bit about what intrathecal administration means. So intrathecal administration means that we're delivering, delivering, delivering the medication directly into the spinal fluid. And IP delivery allows for these medications to reach the parts of the brain that are otherwise not accessible. So for example, when we give a pill or an IV injection, some deeper parts of the brain are not accessible to these medications. So that's why we have to deliver it directly into the spinal fluid. It is a standard medical procedure. the blood draw, it will take several weeks for the study doctor to receive test results. The blood test will identify the presence or absence of SIP1 or SIP2, and it is not being used to diagnose Huntington's disease. And the presence of SIP1 or SIP2 means a patient may be eligible to enroll in position HD1 or position HD2. And it's very important to remember that the presence of SIP1 or SIP2 does not have an impact on HD diagnosis or disease course. And after uh, identifying SNP1 or SNP2, there are additional screening steps that will be necessary before we can um, enroll a patient into a trial. Um, thus far, we actually have been working with uh, the HD community to design the Precision HD clinical program. And for that, we're very thankful. And we look forward to continuing to work with the community um, to move this drug forward. Okay, well, uh, if we are, um, thank you very much for um, that informative presentation. Do you, um, if, if you don't have anything to add, we can move on to um, our, our Q&A. So we've got a lot of, a lot of great questions coming in. Um, we have definitely got several questions about the normal role of the Huntington protein. You mentioned um, wild type versus the mutant protein. Um, and some people were wondering um, how, whether the, the wild type protein has um, an importance in adults um, as opposed to in development. There's been um, a lot of recent research looking at the role of Huntington during development. Um, and so if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, the function of the wild type protein and, and your thoughts on its importance and um, whether there is any concern about lowering the, the healthy form, uh, that would be great. Yeah, so I'll take that question. Um, so the function of the normal or healthy Huntington protein is actually not clear, it's not well known. It likely plays a number of roles in a number of processes, um, both in, in development as well as in the adult 
uh, maintaining normal or healthy brain function. Now, what's been shown um, in animal models is that if you remove the wild type or normal healthy Huntington protein, you can actually make neurons or the cells of the brain more susceptible to a toxic insults or damage. And this is why some people believe that lowering the, the wild type Huntington may actually have adverse or detrimental consequences. Great, thank you. And um, on the same note, we've got some questions about how, uh, how this technology might differ from uh, the other trial that's been in the news a lot recently, um, the Ionis Roche trial. Uh, so could you speak to um, what WAVE's doing differently? Yeah, so um, thanks, Leora. Um, this is a, you know, so, so um, as Dr. Brown mentioned before, you know, we're able to use the WAVE technology to selectively lower the mutant Huntington while um, leaving the wild type of healthy Huntington relatively alone. So this is uh, a very unique approach. And uh, this is probably the main difference uh, between um, you know, the WAVE approach and other approaches. Thanks. Uh, and there's another question that's come in. This is George from HGSA. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer it, and then you guys certainly chime in if, if I miss anything. It has to do with the use of ol oligonucleotides. Um, has this been done in the past to correct gene abnormalities in a uh, you know a genetic disease or a neurologic disease and and I wanted to point out uh, something that was pretty exciting that happened um, at the end of 2016, uh, December 23rd to be exact, where the FDA granted approval for an antisense oligonucleotide that's administered in the same route of administration as, as these drugs are intrathecally or through a spinal tap um, to treat a disease called SMA, which is spinal muscular atrophy, and the results of that study that were done using an antisense oligonucleotide showed that this, this treatment could in fact um, the brains of, of young children affected with SMA and in fact the, the study was stopped early because an interim analysis of the results showed that uh, these children that were on the placebo were getting sick and the children that were receiving active antisense drug were getting better. Um, so the FDA approved that drug within a span of month. So there is the long, long answer to say that there is some history there to show, recent history to show that this type of approach using antisense drugs could treat neurologic and muscular disease. So anyway, I don't know if Wave has any other examples besides this, uh, this SMA drug, which is called Spinraza. Now uh, folks can look that up and if they're interested in the story of it. You know, oh, actually, you know, that was a, a very good example of how this approach could potentially work. So we were very encouraged when we saw those results. We also are um, getting several questions about um, sort of the specifics of the trial, including uh, site selection in North America and um, delivery. Um, other details of that type. Is there um, anything you can add at this time about any of those details? Um, so in terms of delivery, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm uh, guessing that they're talking about the intrathecal delivery. Uh, so also things sorry, like no. time, how often it might be delivered, oh. those details. Yeah, so in the uh, trial, uh, we're anticipating um, dosing people every four weeks intrathecally. Um, in terms of sites, uh, we have sites that are open in um, Canada and Europe, and uh, we're going to be bringing other sites um, up and running. Uh, and so you can check with uh, clinicaltrials.gov for the latest uh, sites that are open. Yes, and um, I would like to add, since we've been um, getting questions about how people um, will be able to find those sites, if there's any um, information about that moving forward, where HDSA will, will continue to, to uh, communicate with WAVE about that. And um, we also 
um, have our EHD trial finder um, where you can uh, easily go on and create a profile at hdtrialfinder.org. Um, and if there is any information about uh, U.S. sites, um, we're hoping to make those available as well. Um, let's see. Um, so we had one question about whether um, if, if someone has the HD gene on, on both alleles, whether they would be eligible for um, testing in the observational study. Um, this is uh, a relatively rare occurrence, but that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah, that is a very good question. And indeed, this situation is actually really rare. Um, we have to say we actually have not encountered that in our experience. Uh, but if you remember how we're using the SNPs um, and um, trying to um, lower um, hunt, um, mutant Huntington, you know, the first thing that actually we are doing is actually um, looking for SNP on one versus the other. So actually the test, as long as actually the SNP is on one of the strand and not both, theoretically the drug could find a, you know, one of the mutant Huntington allele. Um, so theoretically, um, this person would have part of the mutant Huntington lowered, but if you remember, this person also has another one that is also uh, has the abnormal um, CAG repeat. So it, that other, um, the, the uh, other strand that has not been targeted will continue to produce uh, mutant Huntington. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. We actually have not uh, been able to, you know, this is actually a question that uh, we haven't looked at, um, but this is indeed a very interesting question. Yes, we agree. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions actually about um, the the history of the wave drug, how it was how it was developed, how um, the the particular SNPs were were chosen. So the drug is developed um, using the proprietary stereo pure chemistry formats that Wave has, and um, we're using this similar approach in other areas that are under research right now at Wave. But specific to the question around these two SNPs. There has been some published literature about the frequency of SNPs specific to Huntington's disease. So the ones that we're looking at initially are the ones that are believed to be the most common so that we could help address the most patients possible. So does this mean then that um, the treatment, someone asked whether um, this treatment could be effective um, for someone who doesn't have either of these SNPs? So these treatments that we're developing are very much considered to be personalized medicine, and so patients with Huntington's disease have to carry either SNP1 or SNP2 for these first two programs. And someone wants to know um, whether this is actually a way that um, can correct the faulty DNA itself, and um, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so this approach is um, going after that that photocopy, as um, as Dr. Brown mentioned. Um, it's not going after the uh, genetic error in the DNA. Um, so you know there are certainly um, other types of uh, of research that are kind of addressing that. Um, and someone's wondering whether. Um, uh, Maybe Wave can answer this. If Wave is looking at ways to correct um, to correct the faulty DNA itself, or if it's um, if your company is more focused on the, the RNA. Yeah. So this is uh, Jeff. I'll I'll take that. So all of these RNA approaches using antisense oligonucleotides only target the photocopy, as you said, or the RNA molecule itself. None of them will actually impact or alter the actual DNA. Um, now, because Wave's chemistry is specific for these types of antisense oligonucleotides, and these antisense just interact with that RNA or that photocopy, our focus has been to use that approach to try to correct the, um, the change of the mutation in the protein itself, or lower the mutant Huntington protein. 
Thank you. Um, there are a few people wondering about your thoughts on uh, Huntington lowering in early versus advanced stages of the disease um, and uh, how early it might be important uh, to treat given mutant Huntington's um, role in development and um, how it might start doing uh, damage early. Um, so if you could speak a little bit to that, that would be great. Yeah, so this is actually also another really good question. Um, that I think the field um, of neurodegeneration has been grappling with. Um, so the idea is that we need to be able to um, slow down the damage before too much damage is done. So in general, um, I think there is agreement in the field that we need to go early because there's still a lot of neurons to be saved. Now the question is, you know, how early do we have to intervene for it to be effective? And uh, also, just to think of, you know, as you mentioned, um, you know, this is, you know, the, the, um, the accumulation of mutant Huntington actually occurs even before, uh, you know, any symptoms are seen. So at what point do we say we actually have to start? I mean, what is too early? So this is something that we're continuing to look at um, you know, ideally, you know, we would like to uh, be able to get to people's brain cells before, uh, you know, a significant proportion is lost. But um, it has not been determined what is the, um, what is the uh, line uh, to draw. And I, this is George again. Another question. Uh, several of, of folks are kind of asking similar type questions. They've noticed in the cell data that you showed for the two drugs that while it's an allele-specific approach with your, with your precision HG1 and 2 drugs, there was a 20-some-odd percent knockdown of the what we call wild-type or normal Huntington protein in cells. Can you explain why you think you're seeing that knockdown if it's, if it's a drug that's so, supposed to specifically target a particular SNP that's not present in the wild-type gene? Yeah, so I can address that. So, um, our drugs are preferential, and they have a higher impact on the mutant Huntington. Um, likely the reason for that is, if you recall, we're looking at a single nucleotide change or a single change in one of those letters. And Wave's chemistry has optimized that, so we can really um, increase our ability to hit that, that single nucleotide change, as I mentioned. Um, you know, there will always be a little bit of crosstalk between the two. But as was shown earlier, we do have um, very good selectivity for these. So that small percentage change we see in the wild type is likely just to due to a cross-reactivity of our oligonucleotide with the wild type protein. But again, we do have a, a large selectivity for the mutant, pro, um, mutant Huntington protein with our oligos. Um, we are having, thanks. Um, this is, we're getting so many great questions here. Um, we're having some questions about um, whether, um, given that this, this potential treatment um, is not necessarily correcting the DNA, but sort of that photocopy that's being made, um, would, would this treatment need to be um, continued for, um, for a long time, potentially for, for the remainder of a person's um, life and um, how would it sort of be decided um, how that kind of therapy would, would be administered and um, do you think that it has the potential um, to help stop or slow the progression? Yeah, so that, that is actually indeed our goal is to slow down the progression of uh, Huntington's disease. So, you know, based on the mechanism, as you mentioned, it only targets the photocopy. Um, we anticipate that this drug will have to be continued to be taken in order for it to work. So we do anticipate um, administering the drug long term. Um, and we will be, um, you know, for the next, so like I said, the first um, trials, our goal is to look at safety and tolerability. 
But in the future, we will be planning longer trials in order to see the maintenance uh, of effect and also what kind of effect we're going to be seeing in Huntington's disease. Okay, great. Um, I think that um, that's covering a, a lot of our questions. Um, we are hoping to um, follow up with some some more specific ones. Um, yeah, and I think that there's there's a lot of great questions coming in. I think a number of questions just simply can't be answered right now. They're coming from in from the community in terms of you know when will this drug be available for patients. Um, you know, obviously that's an, a, a kind of an impossible question to answer in terms of the trial hasn't started and has to go through the, the regulatory process to get approval. Um, when exactly when the studies will begin in the U.S. and and across the world. Um, but I would say that please know to the community that we're working closely with Wave and, and our, our partners there uh, that when they have information that is ready to be shared with the community, um, we will make it a make sure everyone knows and and one of the great places that a question came in was you know what's that website again and that's htrialfinder.org um, so as new clinical sites become activated and, and recruiting for these studies that you just heard um, Wendy Serena and Jeff speak about please look to that site and uh, it will patch you in to and connect you with the, the research coordinator the clinician in your area that might be able to uh, see if your potential or your you or your loved one is a potential candidate for this uh, this study. Yeah, yep. George. Uh, this is Serena. Jo Hi, George. Um, this is Serena. I just wanted to uh, clarify something. So actually, um, the uh, trials, Precision HD one and two, are ongoing uh, in Canada and Europe, and we anticipate starting uh, in the U.S. Uh, sometime this year. We're working as fast as we can, um, but when there are uh, additional information, we're going to definitely let you know. Uh, we're excited to uh, get started everywhere. Yeah, th thank you for clarifying that. I should have men mentioned that just in the United States they, they had not started, but um, yes, thank you. Great. So I would just like to finish up by saying that this webinar will be available on um, hdsa.org slash research webinars, um, as well as on our YouTube channel, um, and we'll work on getting that up as soon as possible. I want to say thank you again very much um, to WAVE and um, to uh, Dr. Hung, Dr. Brown, and to um, Wendy Erler um, for making this possible today and for sharing all this info with us. And you can reach out to us at HDSA if you have further questions. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.